Do you have a teenage girl who's showing signs of depression, maybe suicidal thoughts or actions? Maybe they're cutting themselves. Boy, do I have a great show for you today, right here on the lifestyle.org podcast. Wow, I'm here today with Dr. Cheryl L. Green. You are uh, gonna help us understand what in the world do we do if a teenage girl, a daughter is showing these signs. You've written a book, the amazing book, Heal Your Daughter, How Lifestyle Psychiatry Can Save Her From Depression, Cutting, and Suicidal Thoughts. Why are you so passionate about this, enough to write a book and, and to be working on this? Wow, well, <clears throat> this is really the entirety of my job, you know, both in my private practice and at Loma Linda, where I have these five groups of basically suicidal, mostly girls, yeah. I would say 90% girls, 90 to 95% girls. Mm. This is like the bread and butter of what I do all really? day, every day. Yeah, and I see over the course, you know, of the groups over the 10 weeks and also in my private practice, girls actually moving from the suicidal thoughts and getting better, getting better, not maybe perfect, but getting a lot better. That's that's good. That's probably gonna give a lot of people hope. We're gonna talk about the realities of it because there is a balance between the hope of there is a solution and the realities of one size doesn't fit all. And so you do something called lifestyle psychiatry. I gotta have you back on an episode just to talk about lifestyle psychiatry, because most people don't know what that is. But give us kind of a nutshell. What is it, your approach to psychiatry that's different because it's this lifestyle psychiatry? Right, well, um, lifestyle medicine is the, it's, it's really a form of medicine with its own board certification. So it mm -hmm. is evidence-based form of medicine. Got started in 2017, actually the first board certifications for that field. And it's all the evidence-based stuff you can do to help with physical health in six domains. They're, you know, they are nutrition, mm -hmm. critically important. Some say it's the foundation of all the rest. Mm -hmm. So nutrition, detox, exercise, sleep, uh, emotional and social connectedness, and um, stress reduction. That's the basis of lifestyle medicine. So lifestyle psychiatry, what that is, it's kind of in its nascent, you know, early days. Yeah. But it's all of that, particularly geared toward the mental health aspects. So obviously, you know, healthy mind and healthy body. Yeah. But there's more like you can trundle into that all of lifestyle, all, all of you know psychiatry as usual, yeah. all of psychology as usual, you can trundle into that, yeah. particularly within that um, piece about the emotional, emotional and social connectedness. Yeah. So I, I love this because a lot of times nowadays in psychiatry, you typically hear about, okay, I went and saw the psychiatrist and they gave me a medication that should help my child to overcome whatever issue that they're dealing with. But I didn't hear you list medication at all in right, lifestyle right, psychiatry. Right, right, right. This is the behavioral part, the lifestyle part, and it can be added to, or ideally, you know, ideally the goal is that the patient's lifestyle alone will support their mental health. Yeah. You know, without addition, you know, the need for additional, you know, substances, but- yeah. You know, we start out wherever the patient is. If they're on medications, we start there and we try to supplement in with the the behaviors, yeah. the lifestyle that can support mental health. Yeah, well, wow. that's, that's huge, especially now. I mean, I don't know because I'm not a psychiatrist. That's why I have you in on the show. I don't know how the statistics changed because of the pandemic lockdown, but just as an outside observer, it just appears that the statistics have changed and it appears that there's an increase in in teen girl suicidal thoughts, much less suicidal actions uh, in 
depression and all this. What, what are absolutely, you seeing in your practice? Absolutely. And you know, we really didn't know the extent of it until last month. Really? When CDC released something called the YRBS, the Youth Behavior Risk Survey, 2011 to 2021. And really, it showed the statistics that, mm. as, you know, almost exponential rise from 2011 to 2020, particularly during the, the, month, the months and years of the pandemic. The exponential rise. And right now where we're sitting is at 57% of teen girls felt um, persistently depressed, hopeless uh, in the last one year. So 57% basically meeting criteria for depression. Um, wow. 30% within the past one year had a suicide, suicidal thoughts. Hmm. 24% had suicidal thoughts with plan. Now that's really important. Basically a quarter of high school girls had suicidal thoughts with a plan, which is the criterion for inpatient admission. <laughs> Hello. Oh, Could our mental health system handle that? You know, it 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 clearly can't, you know, unless we have like an inpatient unit in every school, which obviously isn't going to happen anytime soon. Hmm. Um, and then 13% actually made a suicidal attempt. Think of that, over 10% of our high school girls made an attempt on their life within the past one year. So, you know, this is a crisis, it truly is. I wish I could kind of minimize it or sugarcoat it, but it actually is a crisis. And yeah. there's been no sign of it getting better since the pandemic, you know, quote, quote unquote ended. Right. At Loma Linda, we've had to redouble our units. We had to basically clone Loma Linda's program and put, you know, all of that IOP, partial program, everything in a nearby town. Mm -hmm. um, we had to open a new inpatient unit. Uh, in my own private practice, I've seen this as well, just mm. parents overwhelmed by the amount of suicidality in their teens, wow. teen girls. So you have a couple of other offices as, as well, other than Loma Linda University mm -hmm. School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. where, where are those offices located? Well, you know, I mainly do telepsychiatry. So mm -hmm. I'm licensed anywhere in the state of California to do telepsychiatry. Um, I'm mainly operating now out of my home office, mm -hmm. which is in Redlands. That's awesome. Very, very yeah. cool. The reason why I ask that is because I, I want our viewers to understand the breadth of locale that you're working in. It's not just Beverly Hills where you have patients. It's not just Redlands. It's not just Loma Linda. Um, you're seeing patients from a, a large mm -hmm. swath of uh, of our part of the country. Um, this this is sobering to me. I, I know that we wanted to protect our young people. We wanted to protect our teachers. We wanted to protect our grandparents during the pandemic lockdown. I think that was the loving thing to, to do is to think of how can we protect people. But it seems as if there's one area that we did not protect, and that's our, our teen girls. If one out of four, and the people viewing this, one out of four, which means if you have a child, they are possibly one out of that four group that has a suicide plan uh, to enact. Um, and that increased during the, the pandemic lockdown. That is totally. an incredibly sobering statistic right there. Yeah. Um, but you have hope. You, you it found is. there is some <laughs> solutions. And yeah. so before we get into those solutions, though, I know there's probably some parents who are freaking out right now thinking about baby, you know. Um, right. So I, I want us to maybe take a step back and look at what are some of the symptoms the parents should look for to say your, your child may be one of those four or the 13 percent, you know, about to commit suicide. Um, what should a parent be looking for right now? Oh, and by the way, that's, you know, attempted. So yes. of those that succeed in the attempt, it's small. It's it's around 1% actually yeah, succeed in the attempt. Because, you know, is, fortunately, we have ambulances, we have you know, resuscitation, news, but, you know. Yeah. But, um, but, but still, yeah, just, just, just yeah. the fallout for those individuals, oh, yeah. that the, the societal mark that they have with their friends at school, it changes their trajectory from then on because they have to deal with additional stigma. baggage, yeah, the stigma, stigma of, for sure. well, they tried to kill themselves. And mm -hmm. so it. the only thing young people have to trade, their commodity, is relationships. Yeah. And when their relationships are 
in many ways, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that they don't have an opportunity to have all the relationships that they would want. Um, when it's stunted, their self-value is stunted as well. And so, um, yeah. But yeah. So what are, what are some of the things the parents should look for that would be signs of suicidal thoughts and depression? Yeah, that's an excellent question, really, because there's normal teenage behavior, you know, there is normal teenage behavior. So it's yeah. normal for a teen kind of not to be maybe interacting as much with <clears throat> mom and dad yeah. <clears throat> and little brother and little sister yeah. <clears throat> and more with their own peers. You know, that is yeah. definitely normal. There's, you know, a normalcy to being more in their room, on the phone, on social media or whatever. There's something normal about that. Yeah. <clears throat> they do sleep later in the day. Nothing um, abnormal about that. But there are some real warning signs. You know, for example, if your teen isn't coming out of the room at all, mm -hmm. if they're not getting out of the bed, there's this over the duvet, you know, blanket over the head sign. Yeah. Um, if they're not able to get out, and then if you find evidence that they've been cutting, mm -hmm. cutting is a real warning sign. Cutting, um, even, even if it's superficial, even if there's not a whole lot of blood, we know that cutting, uh, makes that kid 10 times more likely to actually die by su suicide later on. Oh. Among those who die by suicide, there is that tenfold increase in those who previously cut. And so cutting is now looked upon as kind of a rehearsal, yeah. you know, little stress, cut, little stress, yeah. cut. Later in life, big stress. And what do you do? Something mm -hmm. more significant than cutting. So cutting is a sign. Also, um, you know, texting their friends. If any friend says, hey, you know, mom, so-and-so texted me, they're thinking about suicide, real warning. Also, mm -hmm. on the computer, many will actually look up ways to die, mm -hmm. you know, on the computer. And if you look in that history and you see nothing but that, you know, those are huge red flags. All yeah. of that's huge red flags. Also, yeah. not eating. Um, special times to be aware of are just after a relationship breakup. Yeah. You know, they may try to minimize it or trivialize it, but know that that's one of the biggest, biggest things we see suicide attempt after a relationship breakup. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So those are just some of the warnings. And of course, it's different for every girl, but yeah, those are the real red flags for me. I've noticed, because um, in, in my coaching, I've, I've worked, you know, for decades with uh, with young people teenagers and young adults. And uh, one of the warning signs parents should look for is it's hot outside and, and yet your daughter is wearing long sleeves. Oh, yeah. Um, because of long <laughs> sleeves or something covering that um, to hide the fact that, that they're cutting themselves. Yeah. You, you have to be extra observant of these little red flag markers that uh, why are they covering their arms? Um, yeah, so yeah, much. absolutely. Yeah. And of course, you know, most teens are very body conscious, so you don't want to go poking around looking at right. uh, things. But um, and many cut on their thighs where there's no way a parent is going to see that really? uh, or their abdomen. Mm. Um, but you can just ask, you know, yeah. I think. And one of the first things to do, you know, if you have any of these red flags at all, mm -hmm. one of the first things to do is to build up that relationship however you can. Yeah. with that teen so that they feel comfortable telling you something like that. Yes, I'm cutting yeah. on my thighs. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm depressed. Yeah. Opening up that. And <clears throat> what we say, that's that's the million dollar question that a lot of parents ask us. Yeah. Well, how do I? My teen won't come near me. Like, how do I build up a relationship? Yeah. So what we go down to is like the brass tacks of what a relationship is. What is a relationship? Well, it's time. Mm -hmm. And it's open and honest communication. Yeah. You know, that's what a relationship is. And the communication has to be honest. You can't pile sugar coating over sugar coating and hope it to be real. Yeah. It has to start with the honest truth. Yeah. Um, and from there you can make tremendous progress. But unless you get down to that honest truth, you can't. Yeah. One of our big tools, you know, is what we call love letters, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which by the way aren't really necessarily about love, but there is even a template you can look up online. You Google kind of love in quotes letters. Um, it's a template that you can use to communicate and connect with your kid. Yeah. Um, and the kid will say, you know, I love about you 
that you, and that, there's a blank line, you know, yeah. they fill it in. Yeah. And then they'll go down a little deeper. I'm happy when you, you know, do yeah. this or that. But then like, it makes me a little bit irritated when you blah. And then what I hate about you is, <laughs> you know, you get really down into the That's why love is in quotation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So these letters allow you to really uh, vent and get to that point of honesty yeah. where you can begin to make progress with that team. Because yeah. if they're harboring some resentment, they're never going to open up to you. But once you air it, often the airing itself yeah. will heal it. Isn't that odd? That As airing a, it will heal it, but well, often I, it does. Especially for females. Um, the, the, the verbal expression of the internal feeling is a release for, general, generally speaking, a release for females. Um, with males, uh, when they're verbally releasing, they tend to get more agitated because they have to fix it. With women, they don't need the men to fix what they're talking about. They just need to get out. This is how I feel, and they feel better at the end. And so I think it's important for parents to understand um, when a female child, uh, generally speaking, is spouting stuff, they're letting it go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when when a, when yeah. a male is doing it, they're warning you. I'm upset and I'm going to fix this some way yeah. uh, physically. I, and, I totally uh, agree with that dichotomy too. But yeah. one of the metaphors we give to explain to kids why it's important to talk to your parent is this is the, you know, the bottle of uh, soda or whether yeah. the bottle of soda, yeah. you know, the bottle, the lid is on tight and you shake it up yeah. and what happens, you know, yeah. all this pressure, yeah. you feel all this pressure. And so what is the best way to deal with that? Well, Little by little, you let some steam off, you let some steam yeah. off, you let some, otherwise it's, you know, could yeah. be potentially explosive. You just let a little out at a time so you don't have to explode. From a practical, and so you don't have to feel that tension yeah. either. So from a practical standpoint, would you prescribe parents to say, set up shorter moments, not this is not get it all out um, in this one conversation, but just to create some situations to where your child is allowed to express them, express themselves like loosening that cap just a little yeah. bit, a little bit, Absolutely. but not to have the, we're just going to take the cap off because then you have a whole nother explosion problem. Um, right. If all you're allowing that kid is 10 minutes of your time yeah, and you tell them to open up, yeah, that yeah. could happen. Yeah. But if you schedule regular time with a kid and, hmm. you know, they can talk to you as they feel ready to, you know, often one layer at a time has to come off yeah. the proverbial onion yeah. um, until you can get down. It takes some time. Yeah. And most parents don't have enough time, honestly. Yeah. That's, that's another one of the problems. Yeah. You need well, a lot of time. Most families no longer have dinner together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, that's one of the challenges with just having that regular time of debrief, of sharing, um, that many is people's so schedules are just so, you know, all over the place that, that they don't so have true. that time to actually meet together on a regular basis. Um, yeah, you know. and I, what I recommend, even if you're not eating together because of whatever, you know, not home in time, that you still have the after dinner <laughs> moment. Yeah. Like an after dinner date. Yeah. Okay, maybe you've not been able to eat together, but you can still have your little mm -hmm. half hour yeah. after dinner date. You know, the mommy daughter date after dinner or yeah. once a week or however you can arrange that. Yeah. Yeah. Now you had mentioned cutting. What uh, it's it's really mysterious to a lot of people who don't understand psychiatry. Um, why someone who is hurting would want would want to cause more pain and cut themselves? What what's your understanding of why someone would do that? They're already in pain. Why would they inflict more pain on their body? Yeah, and it's not always cutting. Sometimes it's burning. Some, you know, it's, it gets it gets really horrible. Mm. So why are so many teens doing that? Well, right now, it is so common. That there's probably like a contagion element. Some mm -hmm. are cutting because their teens are cutting, and to fit in with their they, peers, rather. They see Sorry. others. Yeah. Yeah, to fit in with their peers, they too, and so. It isn't necessarily as bad as you think if they're cutting just because they want to fit in with their peers. Mm -hmm. But if they're cutting, you know, it is a warning sign nevertheless. And mm -hmm. 
usually what we find, the serious hardcore cutters, people who are cutting every day, usually at the root of that is some kind of trauma, mm. um, unfortunately. And what we often say is at the root of the root is actually usually sexual trauma, I'm sorry really? to say. They, yeah. They've been abused In as a child. In some way. Uh, well, even contemporaneously, you mm -hmm. know, maybe there's that boyfriend who crossed a line, not even necessarily that big a line, but yeah. some line that makes them feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. are like, ew, I didn't want to kiss that guy, or ew, I didn't want him to do this or that. Mm -hmm. They feel dirty. Yeah. They feel defiled. Mm -hmm. They feel unclean and like undeserving. And often they start cutting. Wow. Um, often too, uh, girls will around the teen years, what parents don't realize this is that many girls, unfortunately, in their early childhood had something occur to them when they're four or five or six. They had something occur to them that at the time they didn't really understand. And so it kind of went down the memory hole. Yeah. And when they're 11, they're 12, they're 13, they say, oh my gosh, that's what that was. Mm -hmm. And then they begin to think, oh, I'm horrible. I'm. How could that have happened to me? I'm a certain type of person. I'm unclean. I'm defiled. I'm, and they hate themselves. Yeah. And it's something they couldn't have controlled then. Yeah. And it makes them cut now in the present. And so uh, those girls need a lot of support, and they need a lot of uh, of work. Uh, that's beyond what the parent can do in that situation. I would get professional help for that situation. Yeah. And in general for cutting, I do recommend professional help. That said, professional help is in short supply right now because it's such a crisis. Yeah. We don't have enough hospital beds. We don't have enough child and adolescent psychiatrists. You don't have enough time slots in the day to fill we them. We do not. And sometimes you sign up and it's a six month wait. Yeah. So the question becomes, how can parents help right here, right now? And there are lots of things parents can do. Parents can step up. Yeah. They can be the cavalry that arrives yeah. if they kind of understand a little bit about how to help. I, I think that's what makes this conversation and this episode so valuable because you have the keys to help people understand. Parents understand the lifestyle practices the lifestyle psychiatry practices that they can implement right now. And some of them will probably surprised that the parents how something has such a great effect on their child's level of depression and it's just these simple things including nutrition right and even right. Uh, I, I understand you do blood tests uh, yeah, when yeah. you are doing yeah. lifestyle psychiatry even to see the carbon dioxide absorption in the blood and understand all these factors that I've never even heard of and right. I do lifestyle. I I work with celebrities, professional athletes, and you are in just the cutting edge of how these six domains can even affect teenage depression. So walk yeah. us through what are some of the essential practices that parents can help their teenage daughter in, in ways that may, may quite honestly just surprise them. Okay. Well, I heard in there too about the doctor bit. All psychiatry uses blood tests because there can be really obvious physical issues that a girl has or yeah. a guy for that matter that can contribute to depression. Things like anemia hmm. can, you know, you're out of energy, you're it's tired, tired. Yeah. you're exhausted, you can't get out of bed and that leads to more and more isolation and you go in this downward it's spiral. spiral. Yeah. Same thing with hypothyroidism. Same thing with, you know, systemic inflammation from one thing or another. A lot of people have undiagnosed MS or some autoimmune disorder that's different from hypothyroidism. Um, there are a lot of things. And a lot of kids with anxiety can be, you know, retaining CO2 or they have, you know, they have like sleep apnea, things like that. So the blood tests, other medical tests can, you know, can find obvious medical stuff like that. So yeah, I think... If your teen is depressed, it's worth a medical exam. It's worth trying to get on a list <laughs> to <laughs> see a psychiatrist and undergo that blood work and so forth. But in yeah. the meantime, in the meantime, while you're waiting, um, lifestyle medicine doesn't have all the answers yet. I'm sure the future will hold a lot more that we're just totally unaware of now, but the evidence so far supports lifestyle changes in six domains at a minimum. And there may be other domains 
uh, but at a minimum, there's very, very strong evidence for the six domains of um, nutrition. And that one would be the whole food plant-based diet, Mm -hmm. not 100% plants, and not maybe not everything has to be unprocessed, but by and large, an unprocessed whole food plant. This will um, rectify any nutritional deficiencies, which we know can cause depression states. Deficiency of any B vitamin, for example, can cause psychosis, let alone depression. Wow. You know? So nutrition, hugely important. Mm-hmm. Um, and then detox. A lot of kids are what's called, you know, quote, self medicating. Yeah. Self medicating with a cannabis wax pen, which, you know, quite honestly, I have had as many as half of the teens on the inpatient unit at Loma Linda at one time, psychotic because of use of wax pen. You know, this is extremely dangerous. I highly recommend that if your kid is using wax pen, you stop it. This is cannabis wax pen. It can create paranoia. It can and and does, and I see it every week. And this is legal in California. I believe it is legal for a certain age. If you're over age, 21. At certain, yeah, yeah, a certain age. Wow. And, you know, often the kids are sneaking it out of mom or dad's room. Mm. Is not safe for the adolescent brain. Parents should know that. Okay. Even if they are of a certain age and they are, you know, discreetly using in some way that they find has not been harmful to them, that doesn't mean at all that it's safe for that adolescent brain. It's, it's not, not harmless not, or recreational not for all. the teenage no. brain. No. Mm. Um, And they say, oh, it's making my anxiety better. But in fact, there's a rebound. What teens don't realize, what goes up must come down. Yes. And there is a rebound. What goes down must come up. The anxiety will rebound like gangbusters Mm. until that anxiety is at a a point of paranoia. That's what we treat in the inpatient unit. So um, nutrition and detox from harmful substances then we do exercise. What people don't realize is how important exercise is, something like exercise. You've heard of the runner's high, and I hate to say the word high in any conversation (laughs) that has the word teenager in it. (laughs) But Unless we're saying high school. (laughs) Oh, that's true, high school. (laughs) But but the runner's high, we've done research into that, and not, uh, it's not confined to running any, persistently doing anything vigorously for 20 minutes will Mm -hmm. create that same persistence high. Hmm. So spinning, um, biking, uh, hiking, uh, swimming, any of these things will, if you do them for 20 minutes, your body will naturally release substances that that make you feel much better, much better. So if you're extremely depressed and you go out for a run, that's probably like, boom, the quickest thing you could possibly do. You're you're probably the least motivated to go do anything when you're depressed. Absolutely. That's where parents come in. Come on, honey, let's go for a run. Come on, put on your shoes. Let's go. We're going now. (laughs) Yeah. That's what I I feel like one of the most powerful words in helping anyone is let's, um, having someone do it with you. And so, yeah, that's, I think it's really important for parents to understand, even though you feel like sitting on the couch and watching your TV show, um, that the power of let's um, will help your child to yeah. overcome the depression. Yeah, because it's not just that exercise helps too. It's that sedentary behaviors cause depression. Just really? sitting, sitting sedentary behaviors are associated with increased depression. So really? just sitting there, just the you know, so it's it's kind of a twofold thing. So I always recommend, mm-hmm. well, if you're going to sit, perhaps you can be flexing and relaxing your muscles, flexing yeah. and relaxing. That builds strength. Mm-hmm. It gets your um, blood circulating. It gets your lymph circulating. It's better yeah. than just sitting. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, so I was I was I was running down our 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 kind of blazon. Yeah. So there's um there's nutrition and detox, there's exercise and sleep. Most teens are not getting enough sleep <laughs> and most of them don't realize yeah. that that's contributing. Um you think, you know, it's dead obvious, but many don't. They think, "Oh, I only need 5 hours of sleep. It's not going to affect me." But in fact, it's like one of the major causes. Yeah. They have a huge sleep debt yeah. that they're not addressing. And so for that one, we try sleep hygiene. That's the evidence-based practices that help with sleep. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But among those, you know, among those, they were tested head to head. Far and away, the greatest one of those is actually sunlight exposure. Who knew? Wow. You is know, it just sunlight exposure, vitamin like D3 minutes? release or, or what is the sunlight? It's probably more than just the vitamin D because taking vitamin D doesn't do the trick. Yeah. But the actual, the daily exposure, 20 to 30 minutes a day, that is actually the, the most helpful thing for mm. sleep that they found. Um, probably mm. many mechanisms that we don't even aware, aren't even aware of them all. Yeah. Something about the eye and the light and the, yeah. um, in the, uh, chiasmatic nucleus of the brain where your circadian rhythms are set. Yeah. You know, um, most teens spend all day indoor, indoor, not in a studio like this, but yeah. uh, most indoor settings <clears throat> are about 4,000 lux. And outside at high noon, uh, it's 100,000 lux. Wow. So they're actually sitting indoors, they're actually sitting in the dark, and yet their pupils have adjusted. Mm-hmm. So they think they're in the light, but they're actually sitting yeah. in the dark um, yeah. and, and that affects their ability to sleep your body gets confused is yeah. this day is this night yeah we're diurnal animals but we almost become well not that we're animals but um <laughs> you know <laughs> that's Most another us, discussion yes. <laughs> but um uh uh you know the body needs to know what is day and what is night yeah. and we are diurnal so hopefully yeah. we will reset our sleep clock that way yeah by knowing ah sun this is day yeah you know so i've i've heard other research um where the challenge of the the blue light that's coming off of our devices our phones or tablets whatever especially that teens are looking at it middle of the night whatever it is resetting that clock and it's affecting their sleep because their body's rhythm is being Absolutely. offset by the certain type of light that um, even our devices are putting off at night. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're, I assume you're referring to the blue light that comes mm-hmm. off of cell phones, computers. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> that tricks our bodies into thinking it's morning, actually. Hmm. And what that does is it abolishes uh, melatonin production, which mm. we need to fall yes. asleep the natural way. Yeah. So um, yes, that is a problem. So what we recommend for that is a screen on your computer. If you're going to ideally don't use your screens at all in a couple of hours before before bed, but not many teens can be convinced to do that. So <laughs> they're working on their homework right up until bedtime. Yes, yeah. yes. So we recommend the sc- screens. And if the screens aren't enough, you can also get, um, you know, special glasses. They're called Erlen lenses. They block out the blue light or just blue blocks. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. There are many brands actually of light blocking lenses you can wear yeah. as you're transitioning from screen to screen. Maybe not all of those screens have the filters on them, mm-hmm. but yeah, that's very helpful too. Yeah. Awesome. Not quite as much as getting the sun by day, but it is very important. Yeah. yeah. So you've gone through most of these uh, lifestyle domains. Uh, is, is there more? That, there are uh, two more. Just yeah. um, there's uh, one that's called social and emotional connectedness slash wellness. You know, so it's kind of a big catch-all um, mm-hmm. category, but. Um, it is so critical to be emotionally and socially connected to other people. That is something that we absolutely know. And not only connected to your family, your friends, but also connected to larger things, things beyond yourself, things um, that are much larger, whether it be a political cause or a social cause or you know, national or international or even spiritual things. We know that uh, teens who are connected to a faith are happier on average. Really? People are happier on average if they have a faith, if they have a, a spiritual community. Now, not all teens are into that at all. And for them, any kind of volunteering, anything that gets you outside yourself really hmm. can fill that, fill that need, really need, fundamental yeah. need to get, uh, to be supported by others around you and by something greater than you yeah i think that's where you know uh, people who are connected to their life purpose and this is what i work a lot with celebrities and professional athletes who have incredible amounts of money and incredible followings but they fight depression uh the number one thing that helps them is connecting with their life purpose how do they have the opportunity to make someone else's life better 
Um, how can they make someone else happy, bring joy to someone else? That's part of their life purpose. And that really does change even just the release of uh, the endorphins and uh, in, in your brain, the natural pain relievers um, are, are released in a huge way. I, I read one study where it said, if you do uh, an act of kindness for someone else, that it releases the same amount of pain reliever as uh, a shot of morphine, a basic dose of morphine. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, they were showing that it was even a little bit higher of a pain reliever than the, the typical dose of morphine you would give someone who needed pain relief. Yeah, um, I'm absolutely not surprised. Yeah, I agree with that. Of course, all of these are a double-edged sword. You know, all mm. of these are double, you know, if your teen is making her life and building her life around peers that <clears throat> um, are into practices that are not good for her, are encouraging her to go down paths that are not productive ones that take yeah. her away from healthy things that can be a danger so mm -hmm. this is a re an area where parents can help a lot yeah they can help connect their teen if they are kind of poorly connected or connected to people who would take them down a wrong path they can sort of intervene they can offer other venues where they can other mm -hmm. groups where they can go to the group yeah. and in every group there will be an opening you know, mm -hmm. when you walk into a group, there'll be people you can tell that person's never going to connect with me. And there'll be a person sitting there yeah. in the group saying, hey, hello, yeah. sit over here with me. Yeah. Um, and you can sense, you know, in any kind of well-meaning group, there'll be those openings, those entrees and yeah. a chance to fit in somewhere. So yeah. if you can offer your kid a healthy setting like that. Yeah. And of course, um, this need for social and emotional connectedness, I think one of the most harmful things over the pandemic was that that need for connection was being met via social media. And some of the kids were getting, you know, on the dark web and they were going into these kind of places mm. yeah. <laughs> that I would not recommend them going. Yeah. Um, sometimes even dangerous, you know, yeah. actionable, you know, tell your parent, you know, this kind of thing yeah. is going on, you know. Yeah. I, I, I have two teenage boys. Um, I don't let them be on social media. And uh, the reason why is the people who invented social, the social media platforms don't let their own kids be on it. Um, this is very true. It's mm -hmm. um, my, my boys don't, lack having a social life um, because they're not on social media. We just saw in the years leading up to our boys being teens that um, some of the kids at school were getting in big trouble. Uh, Cyberbullying, yeah. uh, yeah. issues that even caused- Death threats. Uh, yeah. yeah, it caused mm -hmm. many of them to either be um, you know, asked not to be at the school for a couple of days or expelled um, completely, or even in one case, the FBI called in because it was a serious threat. Mm -hmm. um, Teens are at a level of maturity where they can communicate, but they're not at the mental level to where they can predict what that communication may sound like to all groups of people. That that the majority of the teens don't have the the mindset yet or the worldview to understand how different groups of people will hear it differently. And so as a parent, I'm always trying to protect my teens from themselves until they're old enough to protect themselves um, and protect other people around them. Yeah, until um, they know what there is to be protected from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I look at, you know, some of the social media uh, posts that are going on in my boys' schools at, at their different age levels. Um, one's 13 and the other 17. Um, and it's devastating to some of these in junior high and high school students, when someone posts something or says something, or it it just, it's their whole world comes crashing down if someone doesn't like something about them. And now the whole world, you know, everyone's a journalist now. And so it goes out to the world uh, what's said before. I mean, when we were in school, it was just, you know, the, the whispers and the gossip from person to person. Now a person says it and it goes out to the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite devastating to these, it to can these young be, people. Be careful with those photos. Yeah. Yeah. Do not let your teen, you know, take any photos that aren't, you know, obviously 
fully clothed. And yeah, mm -hmm. so many of my teen girls have been humiliated that way. Yeah. Um, but yes, I, I totally agree with you about the hazards. Of course, there are some good things that come through social media and there are some bad things. And the research is very solid. There have been meta-analyses now. There have been, you know, in the hundreds of studies about the effects of social media. Yeah. And we know that for every additional hour spent on social media, depression scores increase. So they don't really? decrease, they increase. And we it's 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 such a solid, you know, fact, so well supported that there have even been studies on why. And so they come up with, you know, FOMO, which is fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. There's the social comparisons and there are multiple other theories about why, what is it about social media that makes you depressed? But one of the things I go to is actually um, a whistleblower from the, you know, this is Jerron Lanier, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly either. Jerron Lanier or Lanier. Um, he's someone who sold a bunch of his companies to Google. He's a you know insider in the social media world. He wrote mm -hmm. a book called um, something I can't remember the exact title. Uh, Ten reasons why you should delete your social media accounts right now, and he oh, has them summarized on the back. But yeah, he even says that there are these algorithms behind social media that actually cause depression. He call he has a name for it. I don't know what the what yeah. it stands for, he calls it the bummer machine. <laughs> and so he wants everyone to know uh, that these systems are operating behind social media and they're mm -hmm. nothing we would even be clued into consciously yeah. Yeah. that do cause depression when you look at social media. Yeah. So it's, it's worth noting, um, I don't know about removing it entirely for most teen girls because of that fear of missing out yeah. with their peers, but just to make them aware maybe mm -hmm. and to limit it to something reasonable and not to let it impact sleep and yeah. put on I, limits, filters, I, that kind of thing. I, I view social media in the, in the same way that um, I, several decades ago, people had this conversation about television. You know, it's the, it's the boob tube, you just get sucked in. And, and when I was a teen, we were talking about how many hours a day that teenagers were watching TV right. and what it was doing to them and the sed sedentary life and all that. Um, so today I view social media in the same way because I have that lens of what we were talking about television. Now I do a television show. I do. I have another one coming out. Uh, we do this on social media. So I have a different perspective as far as throwing it all away. Right. I, you can learn a lot. Yeah. And so, I, I use it myself. Yeah, it's a, they're great communication <clears throat> devices. They're great places for sources of information. And they're great places for you now, especially with social media. Everyone's a journalist, which is not necessarily all bad because now we can share. My, my entire life purpose is to help people, to help them be happy, joy-filled, purpose-filled, live their best life, feel like their, their life means something. And so I use social media. I use television. Um, I use streaming services. Um, so there are benefits to it. But my question to, to people that I'm working with is, do you own a television? Do you own a phone? And most people say yes. I say, no, it owns you. Um, because unless you're able to, in some way, figure out what's its true purpose in my life, do I need to be glued into seeing every everybody's photos? And am I keeping up at summertime? Am I keeping up with their vacation plans? Or are they, oh, they're off to Paris. Great. You know, I'm off to Texas. You know, I got nothing to keep up with them, keeping up with the Joneses. Or are you using it to keep in contact with family and friends, former classmates? Hey, it's so great that we can stay connected in this way. Are we utilizing television to say, I want to get good information. I want to get broad based. I'm hearing a lot of people talking about uh, different topics and it seems to be polarizing. Television is great now because you have so many sources that you can just look at multi sources to get a, a broader worldview than just a single source of information. So from that standpoint, when you're mature and you say, do I own the TV or does the TV own me? Do I own the device or does it own me? Then you're you're able to say, this is serving me, I'm not serving it. But social media algorithms that you've talked about, it's game theory. They figured out how do we lock people in to this never ending scroll? And how can we get in our competitive nature to try to live in this fantasy world of our, our pictures are, you know, <laughs> 
are only what we want people to see of our life. Our videos are only what we want people to see of our life. Um, there becomes this disparity between reality and fantasy and social media feeds into fantasy, fantasy, fantasy. So it gets you locked into being depressed with your reality instead of being excited to see what other people are experiencing. Yeah, totally. And even TV, as you say, I totally agree, by the way, with what you said about television. They call, they don't call them programs for nothing, <laughs> you know? Yes. They're almost program. They're setting your expectations if you're watching, you know, in the old days, they had this show called Live lifestyles of the rich and famous or something yes, like that. Yes, like Robin so I think so many people, yeah, <laughs> they got their, they set their sights on, you know, uh, my life is inadequate because I'm not, you know. Yeah, we don't uh, have the huge mansion with the, with that, with the right. yachts and, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, but yeah, and well, the way I look at it is um, just as you would meet, before you let your teen hang out at the home of anybody, Yeah, you know, you are going to want to meet the parents. You're going to meet meet who's there in that house. You know, make sure you know what's going on there before you let them go. Yeah. God forbid, uh, if you're allowing your kid to sleep over these days in this climate. No, yeah. that's from generations ago. But you still have to meet the parents um, in the same way with social media. You know, look at it. You know, make sure it's okay before you you know allow your kid to you know spend much time on it make sure yeah. their browser isn't tor <laughs> yeah you know because that's the entree to the dark web and you know do put minimal filters on and yeah um, educate them educate them i yeah. love the idea not my idea at all but um the idea of having dinner with your kid where everybody puts their cell phone in a big basket yeah. put their cell phone in the basket with a ringer off and then they have dinner and then yeah. they have dinner. So they're dinner, not texting they go, under the table right. like this, the whole meal. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> After dinner, they go get their cell phone and, and you're done. But that is just such a healthy yeah. practice, I think. And yeah. I, the families who do it that I know of, really, that alone will so do go so far to heal the relationships in the family yeah. and to create that good spirit in the family that you need. Yeah. And to in ensure that your values are getting transmitted to your kid. These days yeah. we don't have enough awareness of our mm -hmm. of our history, of the lineage, of the value of our own family traditions and family ways of doing things because we're really not learning anything about them. We're, we're learning from social media. What do you do when you wanna learn how to do something? When you wanna bake a loaf of bread, do you ask mom or do you pull it up ba how to bake a loaf of bread on Google. And you miss Pinterest. out a lot. You yeah. miss out on, you know, the Irish soda bread. You know, you miss yeah. out on the traditions within your family that have been going on for generation. And those are a value. There's value yes. in that. Uh, I, it's not the throwaway culture. There's real value in that. I th I, I think that's so important. Um, I'm I'm home most days uh, on production days out in the studio. I'll I'll miss uh, from time to time, but it's very rare for me to miss dinner uh, with, with my family because um, you know I, I can't be a life coach and have my family life be in shambles, and so I prioritize that. But it was just this last um, February. Uh, my wife had talked to me in January and. She's brilliant and gave me a brilliant idea. She says, you know, you're out there uh, working with celebrities and professional athletes, authors, experts, all these people, um, and helping them connect with their life purpose. What about our family? And it hit me hard um, because I realized that I'm working really hard to help other people make sure their life and their lifestyle, their whole family is deeply connected. And, uh, and so I actually put together a whole family purpose retreat just for my family. Uh, we went to a hotel in Newport Beach overlooking the ocean, and uh, I literally wrote up three sessions of, who are we? Let's communicate. Uh, where, where are your successes? Where are your struggles? Uh, and then in the end, what, what's the purpose of our family? Not just you individually, but why, why are we together? And, and what can we accomplish as a family together to really help the world be a better place? Probably one of the most dynamic incredible weekends that we as a family have had and we're really close our, our family and uh 
And so actually, I, I've made it available. We're going to put it on our website at lifestyle.org for anyone who wants to use it. But it's these conversational moments with families. And I imagine um, with many families, it will be much like our experience at the beginning. You ask a question. Uh, we have boys, and so we don't even get full syllable answers. You say, how do you feel? <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope is good in our house. Yeah. Yep um, and nope is the vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of teen boys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, always, we're always telling our kids, please speak in full words, please. Um, not just full sentences. We, we need a word um, back. But we notice how it just it opened, and the sentences got longer, and the conversations became paragraphs from, from individuals. Um, and I think things like that, we as parents have to invest in these kids because what is a tradition other than something you've experienced? And if you want to create a tradition for your teen girls to understand, this is what you can replicate in your family when you have children to help them go through these very difficult years. The teen years are extremely stressful and difficult for teen girls. How are we helping them have tools now that they can say, when I'm a parent, I'll do what my parents did, because even though they weren't perfect and they kind of bugged me sometimes, there were certain things they did to invest in me at this time in order to be able to communicate with my kids during my time. Absolutely. And you know, teens often will express one thing, but really want to need another. They'll say, ah, oh, they're not cool. You know, my parents, ah. Uh, wants to hang with them. And yet underneath that, there's this often this crying need. And sometimes yeah. they'll be quite brutal. They'll say, ah, I don't want anything to do with my parents. If my parents were to die tomorrow, I wouldn't care. I would just hmm. walk away, except for the money. You know, I would just, I would just walk away. <laughs> and those are the very kids. They're so angry. They feel so abandoned hmm. that that in my, I've, I've seen several families in that situation. And what's causing that is a sense that they've been abandoned. It's almost one of those, um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to beat you up before be, so that I don't have to, I don't know what the word is, but, um, they're the ones most in need of that connection. They're the ones yeah. who feel the most let down, the most unconnected, mm -hmm. who feel the most in need of that connection. Mm -hmm. They're putting it right out there on the surface yeah. as a defense. Yeah. It's and acting out want behavior it. yeah. that is, it seems the opposite of what they're really and crying for. it is for. the opposite. Yeah. It is the opposite. And so you begin to open that relationship. Those are the kids you see coming in with stars in their eyes. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, mom and I talked. It's all worked out now. And they're like thousand watts, you yeah. know? Uh, and I see the opposite where like, oh, it's not worth working on that relationship with, you know, say it's dad or something. That relationship is ashes. Mm. That's ash. That's that's burned. That's done. That's gone. Um, but even then, mm. there is hope, you know. You mm -hmm. say, well, what about the phoenix? You've heard of the phoenix, yeah. you know, rising from the ashes. There's, yeah. there's always hope. So long as people are still alive, yeah. there is hope. Yeah. There absolutely is hope yeah. of reconnecting of refinding that. Now, not all parents are safe. You know, yeah. I'm the first to acknowledge that. Not all parents, you know, we do yeah. sometimes need things like restraining orders. Yeah. There are jails, there are prisons for mm -hmm. some parents who have been inappropriate with their teens. Mm -hmm. But for those who have not, yeah. that relationship is worth, it's so worth rebuilding. Yeah. Um, that's kind of like the legs a teen stands on. Yeah. And um, when, they one need of the that. More difficult conversations I have to have in in coaching with some families is to tell the parent, remember, you're the parent. And what I mean by that, it's your responsibility to always be more mature in your approach and your response. Um, yes, the young lady or young man may be completely out of control and inappropriate in how they're dealing with you. That doesn't mean that gives you the right to then speak inappropriate and immaturely back to them, be the parent, just understand that it's your maturity that the child is looking at. They see you as much older than you view the distance between you and them in years, but you're the parent. You're responsible for the situation. You take 100% accountability for, yeah, I have a role to play here. Yes, my child is acting like 
a spoiled brat. Well, did I spoil them? Yeah. Did somebody spoil them? Yeah. Uh, they're acting disrespectful. Well, did I teach them over a long period of time that it's okay to speak to me disrespectfully? Yeah, I did. Uh, did I teach them that they could slam the door in the house? Yes, I did. Um, I have to have responsibility as the parent for leading my child into their reality. And their reality says that this behavior is a proper and you know level of response that's appropriate for this situation. And so as a parent, you have to understand, I built this relationship. And yeah, I don't like how I built it. And I want to do some remodeling. But remodeling in any situation, in any home, from a physical standpoint, if you're remodeling the kitchen, it's going to get messy. But you yeah, also have to have the yeah. patience and understanding the remodeling takes time because you not only have to build in the new stuff, but you have to take the time of ripping out the old stuff. And in doing that, it's going to take longer than you want it to. One conversation is not going to change everything because there's a paradigm, the operating system, the subconscious of the young person has been built that this is reality. And now you're trying to remodel their reality. And it's, yeah, to, it's the to parent's own, responsibility. To own up to your, your part in the dynamic, which is the greater than 50% part for sure. Yeah. yeah. Some parents, they... Are raised, most parents raise their kids as they have been raised, mm -hmm. or they try to go 180 degrees opposite and yes. compensate, and sometimes it's there's overcompensation. Very yeah. Much. So yeah. sometimes it helps to participate in one of these. It's called an intensive outpatient program. These are eight to 10 week programs where you and your, your teen participate in these large groups, groups of eight teens and their families. In these, it's called an intensive outpatient program. Almost every big university setting has them. Hmm. And if you do participate in that, you really get a good bead on, well, what are other families doing? And you get to talk with the therapist and you talk to the psychiatrist and you can get some kind of professional clues because I think most parents, obviously anybody listening to a podcast like this, <laughs> they are well-meaning. They're doing the best they can. They are raising their kid in the best way they know how. Mm -hmm. And yet there could be some professional insight into that dynamic that can say, ah, what about this? Yes. What about a firmer boundary there? Mm -hmm. What if um, you know all of the discipline doesn't get deflected off onto the other parent? What if you put some in there yourself? Mm -hmm. Things, little, little tiny tweaks and pointers like that. Sometimes the parent goes, ah, I wasn't yes. doing that. Yeah. I wasn't doing that. And yet it takes that, it takes participation in a larger program to even have the insight. Mm -hmm. I think most, I think 90% of parents are so well-meaning. Yeah. They have given blood. They have given mm -hmm. their life for this kid. Yeah. They really want and are trying their very best. And mm -hmm. that's what I see again and again. Yeah. And it's not easy to raise a teen in this climate. It's not. It's probably the most difficult So many ever. other yeah. inputs. Yeah, so many other yeah. inputs. And um, I've even heard, you know, so what you're saying about, yeah, parents have to own it. Well, sometimes parents are too far gone. They're in drugs and it's actually the next generation up, the grandparents. Yes. I have many, many participants in my intensive outpatient programs who are actually the caregiver is the grandma yes. or the grandpa or yeah. both. Yeah. Um, it's that generation up because of the drugs that have impacted a mm -hmm. whole generation yes. of young parents these days. Yeah. Um, and there is an even, you know, you think there's a divide between child and parent. Imagine the divide between child and grandparent. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've even had grandparents saying, wow, you know, my kid needs a residential treatment facility. Yeah. Why? Because, well, they're having sex, they're taking, you know, cannabis, they're, they're, they're on drugs and so forth. And the kid will say, the kid will look to them blankly. Honestly, the kid will look at them and like, hello, I'm a normal kid. Yeah. You know, I, I promise I I'm a normal kid. Yeah. I'm like all my peers. And there's just no connection there at all. And, mm. you know, there are tough situations like that out there. And we just try to work mm. with a kid and say, you'll learn a lot yeah. in a residential treatment facility. Yeah, And you'll learn, you know, what are safe practices? What are, you know, even though a lot of your peers are taking drugs, are having sex, and they're 12, 
Wow. You'll learn something different <laughs> if yeah. you go to one of these residential care facilities. And if you begin to build that relationship with grandma, you know, it's it's difficult. It's a difficult situation to be in. Yeah. Um, the world is changing so rapidly. And the pandemic, I think, really changed things dramatically the last couple of years. Yeah. So it's not easy. Yeah, I, th I think what what I'm hearing from you as well is just that the parents being open to coaching. Um, I tell yeah. the, the people who are resistant to coaching that I work with, I always remind them, you know, Michael Jordan, even after he won six world championships, he had a coach. I mean, shouldn't he be coaching everyone else? He understood the role of having a third person perspective to help him understand, yeah, you're doing great, but if you just did this, you could be greater. Exactly, um, because it's no fault of the parent. The world is really radically different mm -hmm. from the way it was now. Yeah. And you almost need a, a, a map or a navigator. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A GPS this is what teens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is what teens are like now, and this is what you can do, and this is what you probably can't do a hundred percent. In this climate. Yeah. You know, so the coaching helps. You yeah. know, and I think there are some excellent parents who kind of fell out of bed and they woke up and they're an amazing parent. Yeah. But I think most actually do need some some coaching and some pointers yeah. as to, you know, what where the page their kid is on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been huge, but I, I want people to understand that the coaching and the resources are are continually are continually available because uh, you have a website and you have a book. Uh, tell us about your website and uh, we're going to have the book's description uh, and uh, link for how people can get your book, How to Heal uh, Heal Your Daughter, um, in the description below here on the YouTube. But talk to us about your website, how people can connect with more information. Oh, great. Um, yeah, the website is just uh, HTTPS, you know, colon, slash, slash. Uh, it's just Cheryl L. Green, MD, dot com. Yeah. So that's my website. And we'll have that link below in the description as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's where you can kind of find me and what I do. Um, and the book is uh, Heal Your Daughter. And yeah. there's also uh, a workbook that goes along with that. So Heal Your Daughter is really for parents or grandparents or other caregivers, foster mm -hmm. parents, um, other people uh, who are helping your kid. Um, the workbook, though, is for that caregiver and the kid to do together. Nice. So unfortunately, I couldn't make it with a uh, I couldn't make it with a spiral because what can you do with a spiral but cut? <laughs> so I couldn't make a spiral workbook, but it's just wow. a, a a workbook about the same size as the book. But feel free to write on it, rip it up, use it, work with it. A lot of blank lines to fill in, a lot of places to color. Yeah. Um, where you can really um, externalize your thinking. Yeah and externalize your emotions, put them out there on the page yeah. and work with someone like a loving uh, caregiver to to really troubleshoot those troublesome emotions. Mm. So you're not like that soda bottle shaking up. Yeah. So you can do this, you know, you can let the fizz out yeah. page by page, line by line, yeah. <laughs> little by little, yeah. so that you can, you know, you can feel free, you can come into mm a different place. You can only come into a different place if you really let it be known what place you're in, hmm. release the tension and stress of all of that. Yeah. And then um come into connection and, you know, you can go to different places with your emotions. Yeah. For sure. These things that the evidence shows help the lifestyle stuff. That's not um it's not speculation. Mm -hmm. It's fact. These are big randomized controlled trials. So you know if they start implementing these one by one, little by little, tiny bit by tiny bit, they're going to feel better at the end. Hmm. It won't necessarily be what you're expecting. And it won't necessarily be all of them at work, but some of them are like the evidence suggests these are going to help your kid. Hmm. So That's huge. That gives yeah. us a lot of hope today. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we want to encourage you to click the subscribe button and the like button down below so you can get more content like this to help you live your best life. And don't forget to go to our website, lifestyle.org, where we have other broadcasts and podcasts to help you live your best life possible. We've got blogs, we've got all kinds of stuff for you to help you live your best life. So go join us at lifestyle.org to continue your incredible life's journey. We'll see you next time.